Hey, and welcome to The Short Stuff. I'm Josh, there's Chuck, and there's Jerry. You can hear air conditioning in the background, and this is Short Stuff. <laughs> I uh, got this idea just a couple of days ago. Emily and I are watching Jeopardy mm -hmm. as we uh, don't do every night, but we, we try to make it that appointment viewing. We have a good time watching that show together. Yeah, it's great. Do you remember the time we were on Jeopardy? I know. How about that? Yeah. Uh, it's funny because uh, my daughter will walk through the room occasionally and be like, you were on that show. <laughs> it yeah, sure was. Awesome. Um, so it was a question a couple of nights ago, or I guess an answer, a clue is what they call them. Mm -hmm. And it said something about these two gentlemen, and I can't remember exactly how it was worded, um, but something about like surveying. And I was like, Lewis and Clark, and it was Mason and Dixon. <sighs> And being from the South, you always hear about the Mason-Dixon line, sure. or not always, but it's a common enough term, yeah. to where I was like, wait a minute. I was like, uh, Mason and Dixon were people? <laughs> and I never really thought about it. Of course they were, but I knew nothing about this at all. So I didn't uh, This popped up. Uh, House of Works had a pretty, uh, actually a really good article on it. So um, here we go. And away we go, because I thought Mason and Dixon were probably politicians of some sort. I had no idea they yeah. were the surveyors. You got to be a pretty amazing surveyor for somebody to name your survey after you, especially when it's the one that's as important as the Mason-Dixon line. Because as we'll yeah. see, it's the line that divided the North and the South. But even before that, decades before that, it was a really important line that settled a decades-long boundary dispute between William Penn and the Pennsylvania colony, and um, Lord Baltimore, Charles Calvert, of the Maryland colony to the south. And those two were really going at it. And the reason they were going at it was because Penn was given the land down to the 40th parallel, the 40th degree latitude, north latitude. Mm -hmm. And Calvert, Lord Calvert, was given the land from, I think, like the Potomac up to the 40th parallel. The problem is the earliest maps that map the 40th parallel got it kind of wrong. And Philadelphia, by these early maps, was in Maryland, about five miles within the Maryland border. And William Penn said, that just can't stand. We need Philadelphia. It's really important. Yeah. Like everyone wanted Philadelphia. One day, those great people will throw batteries at Santa Claus. <laughs> I forgot about that. We, we need to claim this wonderful city. They'll make this show. Uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> it's going to be pretty great. And last a thousand years. <laughs> uh, also at stake was about 4,000 square miles. So it was a lot of land. And this was a dispute for decades. And the people of these two areas started to kind of worry that things were getting so heated that they would be like double taxed on their property mm -hmm. because both places would claim that they're in their part of the world. And so finally in 1763, the King of England said, all right, I'm going to get in here. We're going to commission this survey. I got a couple of crack uh, surveyors. One's an astronomer named Charles Mason. Mm -hmm. uh, one is a surveyor named Jeremiah Dixon. Mm -hmm. They're from England. They've got all this fancy, fancy modern equipment that they're going to bring along. They're going to need a ton of booze <laughs> and a lot of people, and it's going to take years, but we're going to finally settle this. Yeah, they spent 58 months, from what I mm. can tell, basically straight Crazy. through, living in tents surveying a 233-mile or 374-kilometer stretch. And they settled that boundary dispute, and did they ever? Because even still today, surveyors, modern surveyors who use geosynchronous satellites to do their surveying are in awe of how accurate uh, Mason and Dixon's survey yeah. line and their, their boundary line work was, that it was just almost precisely dead on because they've gone back. Modern surveyors have gone back and recalculated it. And they're like, that's basically exactly right. Yeah. And I think some of the techniques they use informed surveying that we still see today. So it's, it's a pretty cool story. Mm -hmm. um, so let's take a break. We'll talk a little bit about that booze and uh, how they accomplished this feat a little more right after this. <laughs> Stuff you should know. Stuff you should know. So they got drunk a lot, apparently. <laughs> I guess so. 
I don't want to harp on it, but it is pretty funny. One of the footnotes in this article that you sent. Uh, where did that come from? It was good. I will tell you later on. Okay. Um, the supply list from 1764, and this is just one of the years, <laughs> no. had 20, 20 gallons of whiskey, mm-hmm. 40 gallons of brandy, and 80 gallons of wine. Uh, in the end, they were paid about 3,500 pounds, uh, 35, 16 pounds and nine shillings, mm-hmm. which would be about 300 grand today uh, or about $60,000 per year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they they did a lot of hard work drawing this line. It was very meticulous. They had some Native Americans helping them as guides, some Iroquois people. Uh, they had about 120 people in their party. And they, like I said, they had sort of the state-of-the-art equipment at the time, which, um, you know, I think informed later equipment. But it, it was pretty, pretty crack stuff at the time. Yeah, there's one in particular called a Zenith Sector. And it had a plumb line that ran vertically, straight vertically to the ground. And then it had a telescope that you could, you know— put to different degrees at different angles. And then you had to get on the ground and look up through the telescope to find the star you were looking for. And then you could measure the angle of the star um, with the zenith of the sky, the highest point of the sky, and calculate an angle here on Earth. And that's the kind of stuff that they were doing, again, over 58 months. And one of the reasons why the survey was so advanced for its time is that it was the first geodetic survey carried out, at least in North America. And geodetic surveys are the ones that are so precise, they calculate the lumps and bumps and um, irregular spheroid shape of the Earth into its calculations to make it that precise. That's why it was so precise. But again, these guys weren't using satellites and computers. They were using telescopes and plumb lines that they had to get on the ground to look up to find stars with and their noodles to calculate their findings. I wonder if the the King of England's like, we really just needed you to walk left and drop some bird seed. <laughs> uh, so what happened um, along the way? They, they didn't drop bird seed. This is kind of even more impressive. Is that a reference um, to something? Dropping bird seed? Uh-huh. Well, I mean, the old stories of dropping bird seed to find your way back. Oh, I, I but it was. Yeah, that, that, you never heard that? No, I haven't. Is it like the joke is because like the birds would come eat the seed? I think it was probably from some fairy tale originally. Uh, I don't know, though. Hansel and Gretel, maybe? (laughs) I don't know. I totally ruined this. I really think we're going to edit this part out because I think I'm just (laughs) going to leave it as is. It was so beautiful and hilarious. Oh, I think we should leave it. Um, So what they did drop was uh, (laughs) limestone posts that they brought over from England uh, every mile along the way. And I think it was like 230-something miles uh, in total as well as an 83-mile uh, north-south border between what was Pennsylvania or what is now Delaware, what was then Pennsylvania right. and eastern Maryland. Uh, but they dropped these limestone posts along the way. And then every five miles uh, dropped a crown stone, which is a very, very heavy, like a five to 700 pound stone <laughs> that they carved a C on one side for Calvert and a P on the other side for Penn. Um, sometimes they even had coat of arms and stuff like that. Uh, until they got to the Appalachian Mountains, and then they were like, uh, we can't do these crown stones anymore. No, we can't carry these up over the mountain. And also, it's hilarious. They ship these over from England. Like, uh, we're not sure if there's stone in America, so we're just going to cover now, our beds. Those came from England? Because I know the the posts did. I think the stones did as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, which is hilarious, but also really unnecessary. <laughs> Sure. Well, they didn't know what was over here. So, like I said, the, the Mason-Dixon line has been recalculated, much to the thrill of modern surveyors. And in 1991, I think one of the first surveys of the Mason-Dixon line was carried out by the Mason-Dixon Line Preservation Partnership, which is adorable because there's surveyors from Pennsylvania and surveyors from Maryland involved yeah. in that partnership. And they went around to do an inventory of all of those um, milestones and crown stones as well. Yeah, and they found... A lot of them, which is really cool. Uh, I think they found all but 10, uh, and they reckon just maybe flooding. Apparently, uh, in the Civil War, they would use them for uh, target practice and stuff like that, or just the Civil War in general Mm -hmm. destroyed them. Uh, But all but 10 is not too bad. No, it's not. So, 
The Mason-Dixon line was uh, established the boundary between Pennsylvania and Maryland and also Delaware and then what would become West Virginia. And that in and of itself was pretty great considering how uh, accurate they were. The reason why it divides the North and the South had nothing to do with Mason and Dixon. It had to do with the fact that um, Maryland was a slave state. It was the northernmost slave state. And in 1820, the Missouri Compromise was passed that basically said the slave states are considered in the South, and all the South states are slave states. The North states are free states, and that's that. And because Maryland was a slave state, it was considered the South. And since it's south of the Mason-Dixon line, the Mason-Dixon line was used to distinguish the North and the South between 1820 on. And that's kind of it. I'm sure Maryland today is like, oh, kind of not really, though. Yeah, I think most of the South says the same thing, too. I mean, one of the biggest shocks I've ever gotten in my life, I've led a really dull life, was finding out that Maryland was technically in the South. I, I had no idea. Yeah, I mean, if you're from Georgia, I even remember growing up thinking Virginia was pushing it. <laughs> right. Um, but then I met Virginians in uh, many, I think maybe because they're fairly far north geographically on the East Coast, uh, are sometimes very adamantly Southern. Yeah, they, yeah, they really love horses too. Sure, that's Who that's pretty southern. And then one other little tidbit: so from 1820 to 1850, when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, um, if you were enslaved in Maryland and you could make it just across the border to Pennsylvania, you were free. Amazing, and you would eventually become a uh, Philadelphia Eagles fan. And boo Santa Claus. I don't know if they threw batteries at Santa Claus. They threw batteries at somebody. I, I feel like it was Santa Claus, I know they too. booed Santa. Yeah, that that shows up in our um, <laughs> Black Friday episode if you want to go listen to that one. Okay. Ooh, some dedicated fans there in Philly. That's all I'll say. Right. And by the way, Chuck, the, um, the post that you were talking about is called The Survey of Mason and Dixon, Granddaddy of All Title Disputes, and it's hosted on the Maryland Bar Association's website. The M Wowie, MSBA dot wow. org. So look it up. Fantastic. And you'll be like, this is great. Uh, I love it. Okay, and I guess that's it, right, Chuck? I think that means you know what? It means short stuff is out. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.